The Attorney General's Office in El Salvador will launch an investigation to the deadly stadium stampede where at least 12 people died and dozens were injured. Russian Foreign Ministry denounced degradation of the G7 summit and blamed it for creating divisions in the international system. Warring factions in Sudan agreed to a seven-day ceasefire following talks in the Saudi Arabian city of Jeddah. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Telesu Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The Attorney General's office in El Salvador to go with the National Police will launch an investigation into the events that took place at the Cuscatlan Stadium, where at least 12 people lost their lives and dozens were injured after a fans and stampede. Police authorities say they expect to get to the last details of this incident that occurred on Saturday night when hundreds of people were trying to enter the stadium to watch the football match between the FAS and the Alianza teams. According to local media, police are investigating the overbooking of the event's tickets since it slowed down the access to the stadium and contributed to the chaos. They are also investigating why only one south entrance to the stadium was open when it had been recommended that they open the other access. Authorities affirm that they will establish responsibilities among the club leaders, the stadium administration and those in charge of the ticket office. In Mexico, at least two members of the National Guard were killed early Sunday morning after an armed attack in Jalisco State. The incident took place during a highway patrol between the neighboring towns of San Juan de los Lagos and Lagos de Moreno in the state of Jalisco. Another four agents were wounded in the attack. According to police authorities, one of the aggressors was shot dead and tactical equipment was captured. Likewise, they detailed that the Executive Commission of the State Security Council outlined a joint route to find those responsible and to keep surveillance in the region. In Colombia, a new massacre was reported where four indigenous kids were murdered in Caqueta Department in the south of the country. This Saturday, the Institute for Development and Peace Studies denounced the murder of the minors who belonged to the Muru indigenous ethnic group. According to the non-governmental organization, they had been forcibly recruited on March 23rd by members of an irregular armed group in the zone. However, the four boys managed to escape from the criminal organization on May 15th, but were found and executed on May 17th in the community of Los Estrechos in Solano's municipality. According to in the past reports, this represents an increase to 36 massacres in the country by 2023. In Argentina, members of political, social and trade unions group participated on Saturday in plenary meetings to support Vice President Cristina Fernandez in the face of the legal persecution against her. Under the slogan, Support with Cristina, the Metropolitan University for Education and Work, the participants met from 2.30 p.m. local time at the facilities of the Metropolitan University for Education and Work. The participants at the plenary discussed a document denouncing a new offensive of neoliberalism that persecutes, stigmatizes, imprisons and prosecutes the main progressive leaders of the region. Other similar events were held in the Buenos Aires municipalities of Moreno, Florencio, Varela and Ensenada with the slogan, The Youth with Cristina. Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso will present his annual State of the Nation report in a venue other than the National Assembly, entity he dissolved last Wednesday. The presidency's communications secretariat informed on Saturday that the president will deliver on Wednesday his State of the Nation report in a complex of public entities located in the south of Quito and known as Plataforma Social. The source dismissed rumors that the speech will be delivered at the Bicentennial Park in the north of the capital. The report to the nation will take place two years after Lasso took office as president of the county uh, of the country and on the date that marks the Battle of Pichincha in 1822, which sealed the Spanish colonial independence of the country. Lasso, who took office on May 24, 2021, for a four-year term dissolved parliament last Wednesday and called for early election next August when Ecuadorians will elect the president, the vice president, and the 137 members of the National Assembly. The Italian region of Emilia-Romagna continues to be on threat alert following this week's floods, which have left 14 dead. 
The alert was issued by civil protection officials on Saturday morning in part of Emilia Romagna, in particular on its Adriatic Sea coast, and the provinces of Ravenna, Bologna, and Forli Cesena. In this regard, the meteorological agency reported that the rains will be widespread but will continue with weak intensity. The authorities continue to assist the population and in the last few hours have focused on restoring public services. The overflowing of numerous rivers during the week caused the flooding of entire villages, leaving at least 14 dead, thousands of people displaced and heavy material losses. In Spain, the fire affecting the regions of Urdes and Sierra de Gata in the province of Cáceres has burned over 10,000 hectares. According to the Autonomous Community Authorities of Extremadura, this is the estimate gathered by the European State Agency's Copernicus satellite, as reported the wind is the main difficulty to extinguish the fire. At the moment, the firefighting operations are being preserved, as well as the evacuation of residents from the area surrounding the fire, where 238 people have been evacuated so far. The fire started on Wednesday, May 17th, in the area of Pino Franqueado and is classified as level 2 of danger on a scale ranging from 0 to 3. From Saturday, heavy rainfall and storms slashed Yangshi province in East China and Southwest China Chongqing municipality. From Saturday to Sunday morning, rainstorms hit 41 districts and counties in Yangshi, with precipitation reaching up to 138 millimeters. Meanwhile, water levels in the Puhe River in the southern suburbs of Chongqing rose to near warning levels as heavy rains began battering the municipality from Saturday evening. Heavy rains are forecast to continue in parts of Jiangxi and Chongqing on Monday, and China's meteorological authorities on Sunday renew a blue alert for rainstorms in some parts of the country. Local governments have been advised to make due preparations and plans for rain-triggered natural disasters. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesor English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. At the conclusion of the G7 summit, the Foreign Ministry of the Russian Federation denounced the degradation of this organization and blamed it for creating divisions in the international system. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stressed that the results of the summit in Hiroshima are politicized decisions aimed at restricting Russia and China. The Foreign Minister emphasized that the group of seven statements are full of Russophobia and xenophobia, resulting in creating divisions in international relations. According to Lavrov, the G7 has irreversibly degraded, becoming the main factor in of global problems worsening. The Russian foreign minister pointed out that Washington, with the help of London, is developing destructive initiatives that undermine global stability. Brazilian President Luis Inácio da Silva advocated for peace in Ukraine during the G7 summit. President Lula took part in the G7 summit as a guest, marking the return of the South American country to the meeting of a group that brings together the seven most industrialized economies in the world, Germany, Canada, the United States, France, Italy, Japan, and the United Kingdom. During the meeting, Lula held talks with G7 leaders but did not meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky due to conflicting agendas. During the talks, the leaders of the bloc tried to convince the Brazilian head of state of their position on the conflict in Ukraine. In this regard, Lula advocated a negotiated solution to the conflict in Ukraine with the creation of a group of countries to promote dialogue between the nations. In Greece, citizens headed to polls on Sunday to elect a new parliament to form a new government for a 2023-2027 term. More than 21,500 polling stations opened their doors at 7 a.m. local time to receive close to 10 million voters who will choose the new MPs from the list presented by 35 political parties. The conservative New Democracy, led by Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, is a favorite with 32% of the vote, while in second place is the leftist Syriza party, led by former head of government Alexis Tsipras, with 26% of the electoral preferences. If no political group obtains 45% of the votes to obtain an absolute majority of 151 seats and form a government, new elections would be called. Hundreds of Australians took to the streets this Saturday to demand, among other things, the release of journalist Julian Assange and the withdrawal of the AUKUS military strategic alliance. 
Anti-government protesters gather in Sydney and march to Google's headquarters in Vermont with placards and various demands. Protesters' main motive was to demand the release of Julian Assange and the withdrawal of the AUKUS military cooperation treaty. Demonstrators also called the government to stop any kind of cooperation with NATO. The police blocked the streets in Sydney's central business district due to the rallies and the number of protesters in the area. The Russian government announced that its forces are in full control of the city of Artyomovsk after 224 days of fighting. According to the leader of the Russian private military group, Wagner, the city was completely taken at noon local time. The founder of the military company thanked the fighters, the Russian people, and President Vladimir Putin for the support during the military operation. The military group announced that it will withdraw its troops from Artyomovsk on May 25th after creating lines of defense and control positions which will be transferred to the Russian Defense Ministry. Both security agencies stated that their control will enable the military to carry out new offensive actions and will weaken the defense of the Ukrainian armed forces. The U.S. Defense Department announced a new shipment of arms and ammunition worth $375 million U.S. million for Ukraine. In a press release following a meeting in Japan between U.S. President Joe Biden and his Ukrainian counterpart Volodymyr Zelensky, it was reported that the package includes additional ammunition for equipped HIMARS missile launchers, artillery rounds, anti-armor capacities, and critical material that Ukraine is using in the conflict with Russia. It is the 38th equipment delivery from Pentagon inventories to Ukraine since August 2021. Russia has repeatedly denounced the direct involvement of the United States in the conflict in Ukraine with the constant supply of weapons. Telesur English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries through Starsat, now 461, and enjoy our Latin American alternative broadcast. One functional break, and we'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back from the south. In Sudan, warring factions have agreed to a seven-day ceasefire following talks in the Saudi Arabian city of Yeda. It will take effect 48 hours after at 9.45 p.m. local time. On Monday, the sponsor of the talks, the United States and Saudi Arabia, said in their joint statement. Numerous previous ceasefire agreements were violated. However, this agreement will be enforced by a U.S., Saudi, and international supporting monitoring mechanism. The agreement also calls for distributing humanitarian assistance, restoring essential services, and withdrawing forces from hospitals and essential public facilities. More than 140 Palestinians have been reported killed by Israeli forces in the occupied West Bank and Gaza during the first half of 2023. According to the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs of the United Nations, the Israeli occupation forces have killed hundreds of Palestinians, including children. The international organization detailed that due to police operations and soldiers' raids in the Nablus and Jennings refugee camps, more than 200 Palestinians were injured and more than 50 students received medical treatment after being exposed to tear gas fired by Israeli forces. In this context, according to local sources, Jewish settlers attacked the worshippers before attempting to enter the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Several Palestinian worshippers were injured after being attacked by a group of settlers near the mosque Asbat Gate. The clashes erupted in the area when Palestinians tried to confront the Israeli attack and the Israeli police forces intervened to protect the settlers, firing tear gas bombs at the Palestinians. Thousands of Israelis resumed protests on Saturday against contentious plans by the country's government to overhaul the judiciary. The increased violence unleashed by Israel upon the Gaza Strip during the last weeks, which led to dozens of Palestinian casualties and the resultant exchange of fire force protest organizers in Tel Aviv to call off last Saturday's demonstration. 
campaign against Netanyahu judicial reform, which has been ongoing for nearly five months, showed no sign of abating as thousands took to the streets in the Israeli city. Demonstrations were also held in other locations across the country. In South Africa, LGBTQ plus activists have said they plan to return to their home country next week, even though they fear they could be arrested. Delovi Kuagala, who is non-binary and prefers to use the pronoun they, has been living in Johannesburg in South Africa since 2021, but her visa is about to expire. Anyone who knowingly promotes homosexuality faces up to 20 years in jail under a new law passed by the Ugandan parliament earlier this month. The bill is awaiting approval by President Joweri Museveni. It's an amended version of a previous draft that triggered an outcry from Western governments and rights groups. They stated that it feels like they know what they do when they discuss the bill and what it does, because it feels like they are telling society indirectly to act on the fact that they are the immoralities of the community. In this moment, any time anyone who identifies as queer like myself, um, you have to fight for the right to exist as yourself. But not only that, on my side, I am a photojournalist who can't publish or print any of my work because it is termed as aiding the promotion of homosexuality. Opposition activists in the Democratic Republic of the Congo were violently dispersed by police who accused them of not following the itinerary established by the authorities. According to the press, more than 100 demonstrators stood on Kansa Strategic Artery in the center of the capital, an hour before the official start of the march to protest against the high cost of living and against President Felici Sekedi. Demonstrators came to answer the call of four opponents declared candidates to the presidential elections of December. Dozens of riot police arrived in their vehicles. The tension quickly rose and the police threw tear gas and proceeded to the muscular interpolation of at least a dozen people. We came here to march peacefully. The government said that we are in a democratic country, we are in a democracy, but why are you prohibiting the march to Aves? Look at the police, they are throwing gas, putting people by the clothes. This is not normal. We have come to the end of this news brief. I mean, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. Also join us on our social medias, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.